the area and coming to talk to us, especially all of us that are raising some sort of livestock, which is most of us in the room. Our experience, she used to work with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we've done a few projects together. Uh, she was the first one to dissect or do some studies on the cookie frog for us. So we can cool. figure out what's in the, the digestive chair, so we can figure out what, what they eat. Uh, but she is just recently hired at the University of Hawaii. And she is our new friend here. And we expect to see her on the big island helping our farmers in the near future. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so um, I'm Chinea Odani, and I started with the University of Hawaii August 2nd, and this is already my second trip to the big island, <laughs> so yay! <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I'm the extension veterinarian, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what extension vets do because it seems like there's all kinds of projects, you know, that I'm expected to be involved with. But there's a lot of latitude on I can do things that I'm interested in, and um, it's kind of interesting that I'm here. I was at a dinner, um, maybe about a couple a month or so ago. I sat next to um, Governor Egan, and you know, I introduced myself to him because I was really excited and. I, you know, total mob of that, and I work for UH, and I used to be with Department of Ag, and then he turns to me and goes, hey, so, so what is this about natural farming? Mm -hmm. And I told him, wow, you know, interesting that you asked. I honestly don't know that much about it, but I knew, you know, Department of Ag was going to send some people to that team conference that you were at, and I told him, well, well I'm going to go learn more about it, and I'll come, I'll come find you, and I'll let you know what, you know, what I've learned. And so, I don't, um, unfortunately, the Department of Ag group ended up not going on that trip. So I actually want to watch all your videos and things like that and talk to you about it more in my But um, yeah, it's kind of interesting that the governor is definitely interested in it. Um, but basically, I'm here to talk about vet extension, um, what I can do for you to help you know, as you guys are raising your livestock, um, and specifically about this thing called the Veterinary Feed Directive, which goes into effect uh, January 1st. So I put this slide together to kind of talk about who I am. So um, I'm originally from Maui and I went to uh, Seattle University of Washington for my undergraduate work. I studied zoology there. I pretty much knew I wanted to be a vet, although I wasn't really sure what kind of vet I wanted to be. I went to Davis and it was great there because they let me do, you know, everything. So I did dairy, I did some beef work, um, layer chickens. There were, were lots of fish, actually, trout and sturgeon and things like that. And um, basically, I, I hooked up with a lab there. We did a lot of fish work. Everybody there was a pathologist, so I thought, oh, that would be really neat if I became a fish pathologist. I envisioned maybe coming back to Hawaii and working with aquaculture and things like that. So I did my residency um, through the UC at what they call the California Animal Health and Food Safety Lab where we do diagnostic pathology and that really neatly transitioned into the position that I had at the Department of Ag where I was in the veterinary laboratory. So basically our job was to do a lot of the regulatory testing but while I was there um, I started expanding a little bit more to do, you know, not just the regulatory diseases, but to try to investigate some of the problems that people were seeing. They might be common things like salmonella, but they were still really important as far as production of any um, diseases. And uh, so some of the things, you know, that I did, uh, at least on Big Island, when there was the PERS that was kind of going around, I investigated some of that. And uh, when circle virus came around, uh, it was actually like our group that went around to the different islands and proved that you know we had it. It's kind of an insidious virus where it sort of just sneaks around, I mean it compromises the pigs, makes them not really respond to the vaccines, it makes them more susceptible to other diseases. So we, we did some work with that. Okay, so you know, kind of what I mentioned, I mean veterinary extension, this is a new position for me. Um, I'm I'm a veterinary pathologist, that, that's what I boarded in. Um, so I'm used to kind of studying diseases in animals that are dying or dead. Veterinary extension, you know, it's kind of the other end where now that I, maybe I've done the work and I've diagnosed the disease, now the next step is um, how do I take all the information that I learned about your farm with the body of scientific knowledge, um, the work that's done at UH and elsewhere, and translate that into things that actually work 
for the producers on the producer level. So that's kind of my challenge. Um, I have here support the work of the extension agents, so that's kind of why I'm here. I, I wanted to, you know, work with Mike and, you know, whatever I can do to help you with your natural farming and some of the chicken stuff that you're doing, that's definitely something I want to get involved with. Um, and basically the goal is to improve the health management of all livestock, terrestrial um, and aquatic. So these are basically some of the issues that I'm sort of working on. So disease surveillance control and prevention. One of the projects that I want to get started going, um, I just hired a student, so this will help speed things along. I, I'd like to at least kind of establish baseline, you know, what diseases are people seeing versus diseases that we read about in books or from papers that were published, you know, maybe in the 70s or 80s. Um, heart health programs. There have been some good work, you know, Dr. Zaleski's kind of put together her guidelines. Uh, she, she knows that she needs to kind of update them to face some of the challenges that we're dealing with now. But that's one of the things that I like to do is, at least for all the commodities, even sheep and goats, poultry, put together these um, herd health programs that people can kind of follow as a basic outline of, you know, what are considerations about feeding, what are vaccinations that I should be thinking about as definite do's versus maybes, depending on what we see, deworming protocols. Uh, one of the other things that's really big in Hawaii, um, kind of along the lines of the natural farming, a lot of people are doing organic farming, which if you read the national scientific literature, there's not a lot of information there um, as far as what can people use for deworming, for example, or treating respiratory diseases. And that gap needs to be addressed. Um, there's a poultry workshop in Sacramento in March that I'm going to try to attend and there's actually going to be for the first time ever um, half a day set aside just to talk about organic interventions in poultry. So I was kind of excited about that. Um, biosecurity plants, that's something you know that we used to do a lot with the uh, Department of Ag but that's something you know I think that we can't preach enough. If you can keep the diseases out of your farm, you know, you're, you're way ahead of the game. Uh, regulatory programs, they're you know, the, you, can't, you can't get away from it, so uh, I do work with the Department of Agriculture vet, Dr. Muniz, Dr. Kusuma on this island. Uh, you know, they see certain things in the farms when they do their work. They might tell me about it, but it's kind of nice for me, now that I'm not in Department of Ag, I don't have to work in the regulatory realm, so it does free me up a little bit more to help on different levels. Where it's, you know, you can, you can tell me what your problems are without fear that I'm going to be like, oh, okay, now we have to report to you. You know, there, there are certain diseases that are definitely triggers, but there's a lot of other things that I can help you guys with. Um, animal ID premises registration, that, those are some other things that we're working on. Waste management is you know, a big deal, and I think the natural farming techniques, uh, you, know, you guys are really offering some, some new approaches to that. Slaughter and processing issues, that's something that I've got to get into. Uh, nutrition and selection and use of animal health products. So that's kind of, um, I think, a, a link to direct link to what you guys are doing, um, how you guys are feeding the animals, and what you guys are doing maybe with the waste, and certainly um, what kind of what, what I mean by animal health products. So that might be, you know, what vaccines do you guys use? Do you have to use? Um, yeah, and see, and that's the thing that I really want to learn about. I've, you know, heard a lot about the natural farming thing. I've always just kind of wondered. Really, what, what happens to the salmonella, or you know, some of these viruses that we're talking about? You know, I I'd be really interested to to really look at your farms and see, you know, what's going on. I mean, I'm sure that they're there, but probably just on lower levels that the pigs are able to manage. You know, so I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I'd like to learn about. Okay, but why I'm here is about the veterinary feed directive. And veterinary feed directive uh, basically came about because of consumer attitudes towards antibiotic usage in animals. And a lot of it might be based on misinformation, but we, we do know that there needs to be some changes in how the veterinary field um, approaches antibiotic usage in animals. And especially now that we're seeing more and more reports of resistant bacteria that you know, we certainly don't want to be in a situation where humans are suffering because drugs no longer work in them, and maybe it's related to inappropriate usage of antibiotics in animals. Um, there's some data that kind of shows that maybe that's not the case, but nevertheless, public um, perception is that it is. So there's been um, a lot of work that the FDA has been 
um, doing over the last decade where they're trying to restrict access to certain classes of antibiotics um, and making some mandatory changes in how antibiotics are used in animals. So for example, um, feed was kind of the loophole. You know, there were always regulations on what you could inject into a pig, what you could give it orally, um, prescription medications were regulated, but there weren't the same kind of restrictions on bimedicated medicated feed that might contain the same antibiotics and um, you know, just giving it to pigs, um, maybe not even to treat a disease or prevent a disease, but a lot of times, you know, it was just given to promote growth. And that's really the area that the FDA has kind of cracked down on is come January 1st, we're not going to be able to use medicated feed to promote growth. It has to be for um, a disease situation based on the, the label of the feed. Okay, so um, basically these are the guidance documents, 209, 215, 515, and there's a whole bunch of other little numbers. Um, but, and and I, ha I brought the printout with me if you guys wanted to take a look at it, but I, I kind of thought I'd just distill down the main points to you guys. So, um, 209 is the important one. It's, it basically summarizes what the changes are that's gonna be happening. So, number one, it's, it's gonna require that drugs that are given to food animals are necessary for animal health. So we can use it to treat you know, diseases in animals. Um, we can even use it to control. So it's, the difference between treat and control is, treat is if you have a sick pig and you give it drugs to make it better. Control is when you have a sick pig and then you treat the pen mates so that they don't get the same disease. So prevention and control usually go hand in hand to try to minimize um, the effects in a herd. And um, they're also moving some of the things that were once over the counter into the realm of things that now require veterinary oversight. So for example, um, feed antibiotics used to be over the counter. Now it's gonna be governed by this thing that they call veterinary feed directive, so it's under the um, supervision of a vet. And then uh, for water also, it's not gonna be over the counter anymore, but you write prescriptions instead. And it doesn't affect all products. So um, I have this table here. So a lot of the things uh, like the ionophores, those are like the coccidia stats um, to prevent coccidia and poultry and pigs. Those are not gonna be affected. Um, and some of the antibiotics that we use in food animal production that are not used for human medicine, those are the ones that are untouched. But the ones that are affected by this, these new rules are a lot of the really common ones, so penicillins, uh, the cephalosporins, that's like new floor, um, quinolones, fluoroquinolone, tetracycline, that's LA200, um, sulfas, you know, so a lot of different things are gonna be affected by this new ruling. And um, GMT is kind of the health thing. So, you know, it's it kind of, I am not sure if you guys have heard about this before. Maybe it doesn't affect you if you guys are not using medicated feed. So, so maybe that's, um, you know, maybe this is all actually really irrelevant to you guys. Um, but they've been talking about this for about three years and most of the major feed manufacturers are on board and they are licensed by the FDA. You know, they've got their labeling in order and whatnot. And basically what the veterinary feed directive is, it, it's just a piece of paper. So kind of how a prescription is a piece of paper where the doctor will write, you know, blah, blah, meds for this animal. Um, the VFD is very similar, but it has certain uh, language in there. So for example, there is an expiration date. So uh, a vet basically has to come out to visit that farm within 12 months probably better for it to be more like every six months to have a valid relationship with the, the owner. What we don't want to be in a situation is where you might have a vet in Iowa kind of writing these prescriptions for people in Hawaii. Um, you know, that, that could happen. But with the VFD, it, it at least requires um, a licensed Hawaii vet to write these VFDs out. Uh, we'll describe exactly what the condition is for. So we might say it ought to be uh, for respiratory disease in growing pigs, 50 to 150 pounds. So things like that, so it's not just, oh yeah, you can use it on your farm however you wish. And you know, it's really just to ensure that we're using the antibiotics responsibly. Um, I have copies of that, or I can email you guys copies of that. Okay, so I kind of just talked about this. I think um, one of the things
things that's really important to Bill is the withdrawal time. So that's something that's brought front and center about the withdrawal time. Um, so that means, you know, if you, a, a lot of these medications, they'll have, say, a, a 21 day withdrawal time, which means that the last day you feed it to the pig, now you have to wait three weeks before that animal can go to slaughter. And that's mostly because we don't want these antibiotic residues entering the food, the food system. Um, these VFDs need to be kept for two years. There's three copies. One copy goes to the vet, one copy goes to the owner, and one copy goes to the person who's manufacturing or delivering the feed. Uh, everybody's got to keep it for two years. And uh, that's it, just have some summary things. And um, extra label use of antibiotics in feed is absolutely not allowed. So in other words, if um, say the Lincoln mix is saying, oh, it's for, uh, dysentery in pigs. Unfortunately, you can't use it for E. coli in pigs, or you can't use it for respiratory disease in pigs. It's got to be for whatever it says it's labeled for. Um, there is still extra label medication that's allowed, say, orally or injectable, as long as it's under uh, veterinary use. And for those of you maybe who uh, do small ruminant, um, husbandry or poultry, you know, a lot of the drugs are not labeled for use in those species, but because of the Minor um, Use Drug Act, you're stay, still able to use medication as long as it's under uh, the supervision of a vet. So, and that, okay, so that's basically all I have. Um, I, I really just wanted you guys to know who I was, and if you guys are, you know, interested in using medicated feed, and you don't have a veterinarian, you know, come talk to me. I can kind of figure out, you know, who to put you in touch with. Um, you know, really, I'm here just to answer any kind of questions you have related to animal health, you know, which is very broad. So it's um, infectious disease, it's um, nutrition, it's anything. And I'm not saying that I'm going to know all the answers, uh, but at least I, I'll be able to find the answers for you. Uh, there's a lot of good people with a lot of good knowledge that I can put you in touch with. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Will you be willing to write prescriptions for the pieces of sand? Can you do it? You know, I've been told that I cannot. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is get in touch with vets who are willing to do it and kind of discussing with them what, you know, like like how, how I think the program should work. So I would like the vets to visit the farm once a year go over all the husbandry stuff, charge just a flat rate. I haven't figured out exactly what that's gonna be, but it's probably gonna be between $50 and $100. And then after that, whenever there is a disease issue going on, I like it so that you don't need the vet to necessarily come out there because that's where things get really expensive. But maybe if there can be just good communication with the owner and the vet, or maybe even involve me because you know I, I, I'm free. I, I can't collect payment for anything. Um, and then I work with the vet and we get things done for, you know, just the cost of writing, the, you know, their time to write out the script. Um, be, because I work for the university, that, that's kind of why they said they, they don't want me going into private practice, potentially competing with private vets. What about university projects? University projects, yes, I can do that for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So basically, I am the vet for all the UH animals, I've been told. So, yeah. Yeah. How did you feel about the Korean group raising quail and using the extra to raise? Okay, so when you first started talking about that, I was thinking, oh, yeah, I don't know that that's so good. But then when you talked about how they fermented it, that is the game changer to me. I don't know, that, you know, I, I honestly have no idea what the data is on that, but I think that if the fermentation process um, works the way it's supposed to, it for sure can break down the pathogen load. Um, but that, that's the kind of stuff that I'd be interested in looking at. Uh, my understanding is that I might have to uh, research it a little bit. Mm -hmm. my, my academic background as yeah. well, uh, is that it violates U.S. law. Now, the question of permitting it to break down the pathogens, uh, I would think that a, uh, that a uh, argument could be made to FDA that there should be a regulatory provision for that. 
to the best of my knowledge, there currently is not. There currently is not. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm not familiar with all of those rules, but I know, for example, um, for using things like that for fertilizer, you can't use untreated excrement, and that's probably related to those. The, uh, what they consider the treatment has to be composted before you apply it. Before you apply it, yeah. So, and I mean, fermentation is part of composting. I mean, if you will. Uh, and so maybe yeah, more work can be done with that. The reason for the rule was it uh, used to be the practice uh, not so very long ago to feed uh, commercial poultry house waste directly to the cattle. Uh -huh. So if your poultry had salmonella, then you can't even have some. Yeah, yeah. So that would be the big one. That would be more. I don't think anybody at the regulatory level has thought about does it make a difference if you if you come if you permit the, uh, the waste. So that probably hasn't been addressed. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm sure it hasn't, um, but that I think is a body of work that probably does need to be looked at. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially if we're talking about sustainability because, you know, like I said, waste management is a huge issue for a lot of farms. And if you could do something with it to turn it into something useful besides just um, fertilizing grass, but what I found with FDA is that they will consider changing their rule, but you've got to present it with the evidence. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, unfortunately, I don't know that that's the kind of thing that we couldn't necessarily do the research here in Hawaii. But what I've kind of thought about is a lot of times if we do small pilot projects here, we can get the attention of USDA or the FDA, depending on which group you're working with, and then that might trigger them to look at it a little harder. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, um, with natural farming, largely like when when there was a virus outbreak um, with pigs in Waianae, mm -hmm. there was one farm in Waianae that did not get the disease, and they were using the natural the um, the deep litter system. Mm -hmm. And so, are you interested in studying farms that are not having problems? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I. I um, I would say both, you know, I mean, for sure, anybody who's having problems, my first goal would be to help them, but yeah, it's the people who have really nice, stable, disease-free systems that I, I'd like to look at to see what's going on. And I, and I know who you're talking about on Oahu. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to visit his farm, but um, some Department of Ag people did, and they, they were really impressed. Yeah. So far, our natural farming facilities here have all created negative for circle virus. We've taken blood from pigs at different farms that show the high titers, and they've taken the natural farming ones we don't have. So that that is the type of studies that we that's yeah, so that's we need to help contribute in yeah. to show why this thing works. Yeah, no for sure. So um well one of the things uh Dr. Zaleski wanted me to kind of give a pitch. So come March, we're going to have a veterinarian from Nebraska, Thomas Patsnick. We're going to bring him in. We got a Maui County grant for this project, so we're going to start a Maui. We're going to do a series of farm visits on Maui and Molokai, kind of take him around. He's going to act like the veterinarian for these farms. So he went ahead and he got himself um, licensed in Hawaii. Uh, she wanted me to just kind of mention that see if maybe there was interest from Big Island because we could add on other islands. We're probably going to add on Oahu because there is interest there. We're asking producers to contribute $100 to be part of the farm visit. And we'll, but we'll do a free workshop for everybody just so they can kind of hear what's going on. Uh, one of the things that I have a student supposed to be working on, she's going to start in January. Um, she's going to be doing surveillance of pig farms. So two things, we're going to do a disease surveillance, so kind of collecting feces, looking at parasites, testing for PED, we're going to do blood surveillance, we're going to look for circle, we're going to look for PERS, um, mycoplasma and some other things. But the other side that I think is going to be really interesting along the lines of what you're talking about, we're going to develop a questionnaire where we're going to look at management practices. So that's where we're going to figure out who's doing natural farming and who's not. And then we're also going to look a lot at biosecurity practices because um, we feel that that's one area that does need work. So we'd like to document that maybe not, 
not a lot of people are doing it, so we can justify asking for grants to help us go out there and um, you know, promote it more. So yeah, we, we have that in mind, and that's um, yeah, something that we're gonna do with the swine for sure. Um, I'd like to look at um, you know, other, other um, commodities too, so sheep and goats and chickens too. So, so what are you guys all raising livestock-wise? Pigs, chickens, cows. Sheep. Okay. Yep, yeah. Sheep. So perfect. Yeah. I got awesome. Sheep. The state has its draft biosecurity protocols out for public comment. I'm not sure what the deadline is on it. Oh, no, I don't know. I don't know. But the uh, state has its biosecurity protocol out for public comment, and it would be worthwhile for you uh, as a group to take a look at it and uh, see how it affects natural farming, provide, provide appropriate comments. Just blown away because all of our natural farming computers were negative, and everything else was all positive. Yeah. And she argued with me, so it's got to be in a compost area. They take all the compost you want. The way I look at it, the pigs don't have it, it's not in the compost because the pigs would have it. The pigs would have it. It was there. So it's, you just check in for nothing. It's costing the state a lot of money. Yeah. But all the washed down pigries, all the other type of management, they have something for my own. And that's, I mean, it's kind of a nasty virus, you know, it causes wasting in the pigs and um, on Oahu, a lot of people, you know, they, they're in situations where they have to vaccinate for it, otherwise they really just lose too many. And it's, it's just, you know, it's a waste of feed. Yeah, they, they just can't ever get them up to market weight. Thank you very much. Yeah.